fabulous Lisbon, Bromley, London, Wilson. New York. We're actually, um, in terms of panelists, tuning in from New York, London, and LA. So it's a global conversation, which is always really nice. Um, and yeah, I think it's time to start. I'll introduce myself. I'm Magdalena, and I work for Second Home. Uh, Second Home, for those of you who aren't aware, we're a creative community focused workspace and we're also a cultural venue and we have locations in Fabulous, Lisbon, Bromley, oh, London. Sorry, that's Lisbon. my, um, that's the yeah. YouTube speaking. We're actually, um, in terms of panellists, oh. sorry about that, probably on my side. Um, so Second Home, we're a creative workspace and we're community focused and we also have cultural venues and we've got locations in London, LA and Lisbon. We're designed about bringing entrepreneurs together from all different types and small and emerging businesses because we believe by creating a me mixed ecosystem of individuals that that's when good things happen because um, diversity makes creativity stronger. And my job at Second Home is to create our public facing cultural programme, which basically is designed to bring in different speakers from all different disciplines, all different industries, because we fundamentally believe that you become inspired when you're exposed to new ideas and new ways of thinking. And, you know, it's been a interesting year, but one of the best things to come out of it is our partnership with the lovely Baguren Institute, which is where Rachel is from and all our events that have been digital are part of an ongoing public series which is designed to bring in the most interesting and forward thinking uh, figures of today to come and exchange cultural, social and political ideas. So before we kick off, I'm just going to pass over to Rachel to tell you a bit more about the Baguren Institute and sort of um, how we got to know each other, I suppose. <laughs> Sounds, sounds great. Uh, thanks so much, Mags. We're, we're really excited for the new partnership at the Burger Own Institute because it allows us to, uh, to connect with all of you here um, and to learn more from uh, people like Blair, Lee, and Edward and their ideas and their work and to encourage dialogue to, such as today, you know, both locally and globally as it relates to August 28th. And the Institute was founded nearly a decade ago. We're a think action tank, I guess is how you could, um, uh, what you could refer to us as, but uh, we're really an ideas-based organization. We were founded to develop and nurture ideas about how to reshape, reshape our political and social institutions in the face of the transformation sweeping our world. Um, we work, we're working on the front lines of rethinking democracy, uh, rethinking uh, capitalism, and even uh, the very de definition of what it means to be human. Uh, so it's a tall order, but it's the very reason why we like to engage and we seek out the ideas of others. Um, and as the state reminds us, uh, we, um, and any student of history will really tell you that uh, change happens through ideas and uh, so it couldn't be more fitting to, you know, to hand it over to everyone today and, and really to get to know on the basis of what ideas um, do you think we will build a better world? Oh, thank you so much, Rachel. No, it's an absolute honour. And so I'm now going to say goodbye to you in the world of Zoom and she'll come back a bit later, but we will be sending around after this event some more information on the Burgoon Institute and we do have lots more exciting events coming up. So thank you so much, Rachel. Um, okay, fabulous. So the um, welcome everyone. And I just wanna say firstly, um, I came to organize this event with Edward who is gonna be my co-moderator. Edward is the um, Chief Innovation Officer of Dow Jones and we've been in conversation for quite some time about collaborating together so it's um, yeah it's been an honour to work with everyone here and it's sort of amazing it all fell together and um, yeah um, August 28th is a very exciting day and um, mostly because it's uh, Lee's birthday uh, so everyone please say happy birthday to Lee, 
Um, he was at Lee, you were actually the one that um, drew attention to August 28th when we originally approached you to be in conversation with Blair. Um, can you sort of tell us a bit about um, how you came to know the sort of significance of August 28th as a day in um, US Black history? Uh, well, in my research for Nobody's Slave, How Uncovering My Family's History Set Me Free, I studied my great grandfather, Isaac Pugh, who was murdered in Greenville, Alabama by a black, a white man named Jack Taylor. And when I went into the files, I found a newspaper article that said that Jack Taylor was acquitted in less than a few minutes. And I saw that date, August 28, 1914, uh, which was then the day that I was born was the same day that my great grandfather was killed. And I just became very intrigued about it. And as I continued to look, I realized as well that Martin Luther King had delivered the I Have a Dream speech on that day and that Emmett Till was killed on that day and that the Tuskegee Syphilis Project settlement happened on that day. And I realized and processed it as a day of tragedy and hope, which is so uh, reflective of the broader African-American experience in this country that when all of these things that have happened to us at the hands of our government, at the hands of our, our fellow citizens, even when we were not considered citizens in this country, we still thrive past all of those barriers. And I think that, so this is a, a historically significant day because it just sort of exemplifies the broader reality that we face and our ability to be resilient and our ability to be tired of having to be so resilient in this country and understanding that um, we will continue to fight and to understand the, the, the role that protest plays in the human rights struggle and the role and the leadership that African-Americans have shown historically in making sure that America is held to a higher standard. So it's significant in that way as an American day as well, not just African-American day, but for African-Americans -Americ as a whole, we have all benefited from the reaction that African-Americans have had to the tragedies that have happened on this day and the things that we've done that are positive to uh, move past, try to our best to address the trauma as it happens. Absolutely, and I think it's amazing that we're able to have this conversation on the same day that a march 57 years later is happening on Washington you know to stand up for some of the same but also you know bringing hope to everything that's occurred this year I mean Blair you're a historian and you know you've spent a long time understanding U.S. Black history were you aware of the significance of August 28th and how do you feel throughout since perhaps 1963 things have evolved what are we still asking for but also what is new surely you know there's so many uh themes in terms of numbers that you can really latch on to throughout black history whether it's looking at you know groups of people coming together a little rock nine um you know you can just continue to put to pull things out it also speaks to the fact that in the United States, so much happens so often that so many things parallel. As I was recording my podcast, America Did What? In fact, we were having those same moments where we would record our podcast about uh, the lynchings in uh, the United States in the, 19, uh, in the 19 teens, as well as the shark attacks that happened, and then find ourselves recording on the date that something significant had happened. Uh, and this past one, it was uh, July 25th, was significant in what we were recording and also in the historical moment. And that's the day that we were recording. Um, so the ancestors, you know, I'm a very spiritual uh, woman of faith. I, I constantly feel that uh, it's not an accident, you know, uh, and it's, it's, reoccur it's reassuring for me. You know, some people speak about ghosts or spirits in a way that is very frightened in, in induced. Um, but for me, it's, it's really feeling in touch and feeling connected to not only your own legacy, but realizing it's rooted in, in the past and that you're standing on the shoulders of giants every moment. Um, now the occasion though, it does come from tragedy. So while it is joyous that we have these connections and that it's Lee's birthday, happy birthday Lee. Um, but it's also, you know, the death date of, of Emmett Till. It's also the, the day that the 
uh, Tuskegee syphilis experiment, you know, I call it this Tuskegee syphilis atrocity because that's more accurate. An experiment makes it sound like they were participants and then it went wrong. From the jump, it was created to be a human rights atrocity. So that settlement happened that day. Then we have the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. So there's just so many layers and we have to be reverent in that. We have to honor that. And it's also different than the way I teach history, the way that I educate folks about history. I think that a lot of us, you know, myself included, when we talk about history, we can look at the dates and that's how we're, you know, we're focused on things, whether that has to do with, um, you know, the way uh, we have to recite things, we have to take exams, it's anxiety inducing. So these dates are important, but I try not to make it feel like it's, uh, you know, a, an oral exam or a test. And it's just so exciting to me when we can detach that, but then you know, find moments where it really comes back in and it makes sense. And this is the time. So right now we have this March on Washington, which is a revival of the 1963 March. Uh, and it's not just symbolic, but it, it's crucial. You know, at first I was having my apprehensions. I'm like, is it does it make sense to do a symbolic march? But as I'm listening to the speakers today and I was listening on the news this morning, they are so connecting it to the current moment. There's this perpetual concern with folks of my generation, I'm 26, that the elders aren't listening to us. Not only are they listening to us, they're uplifting us. Uh, and the ancestors are too. The ancestors being elders who are no longer with us. So uh, it feels like a big warm hug from the universe and encouragement to say, keep going. We're in the right direction. Absolutely. And I really, something that I find quite powerful that it's a commitment march. You know, it's holding true to the values and the words that Martin Luther King was saying in 1963. And even this week, it's been quite, amazing like the horrendous shooting of Jacob Blake you know and then in protest the NBA players and other sportsmen going on strike you know the Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans you've got Hurricane Nora you know it's these things do come around they are cyclical and it's how we respond to them in the moment and it is an ongoing conversation so I think the march is a really important thing and the fact that it's also happening online virtually too at the same time is representative of today and the challenges we're facing with COVID and you know so I think it's an exciting time there's been a lot of you know horrendous events that have occurred this year but hopefully there's a sort of more there's a consciousness that's coming out of it and you know please please um can you know, book tell us more about the sort of journey you've gone on through your personal history um, your family's history throughout the generations. I, I'm sorry, the last, I saw I heard your reference to my family and intergenerational, but what was the first part? I was just saying, tell us about the journey you've gone through when you studied the history of your family. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so in preparation, this journey is, has been a five year journey. It's something that evolved out of my curiosity about my father who was born in Greenville, Alabama in 1948. And I realized that when I was growing up, I could, my father had nightmares uh, many nights and he would not really talk about what he had experienced and what the nightmares were about. And then as we got, as I got older and we it moved to an adult friendship, he started opening up, opening up to me about segregation and what he had seen in Jim Crow, Alabama. And he had questions about his family lineage because there was a lot that his parents and their parents hid from him. Since 1837, I've had a murder on e either side of the family all the way through 2015, my cousin Rochelle. So it's important to understand that this was not just laws slavery and, and Jim Crow were not just laws that were created to oppress African Americans, but the psychological and emotional um, trauma that we experienced was a part of that. And so I was very interested in finding out about why my father had these nightmares. And I was able to reveal all of the things about the homicides. And it showed me the leg, it revealed the legacy of racial violence in this country and how inextricably tied racial violence is to the not only the founding of the country, but the continued, the, the continue, continued growth of the country. And so it's an American story. And I think that part of the problem that we're having today is the 
the refusal to accept that from 1619 to 1964, legal white supremacy was the law in America. And so it's been all but 56 years that America has not been a country that had these laws that were intentionally written to make white individuals superior to black individuals in the eye of the government. And so we're going through a transitionary period here where people are still having to, trying to process this and to understand that equality does not mean oppression. It doesn't mean that because African-Americans want freedom and because African-Americans um, feel entitled to this as Americans, that somehow that comes at the expense of white America and that there, it's a zero sum game. And so, and that these are mutually uh, exclusive concepts. And so that's a big part of this story. And it's important to understand why African Americans are protesting and once again, holding the country to a higher standard and leading the country to this, this, this sort of um, goal of becoming a more perfect union. Hey, um, this is um, Edward. And um, first of all, a very happy birthday to you. Um, and uh, I hope that you're, um, you know, you're able to enjoy the day as well as reflecting on some of the historic significance of the day as well. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on the historic theme because in your reporting for the Wall Street Journal, um, you've been speaking to um, some of the civil rights leaders, some of the remaining civil rights leaders of the 1960s. And I'd love to hear you say um, the picture that they've painted about protests then versus protests now. And I think some of the results that you, some of the reporting that you had uncovered some surprising views from these leaders. And I wonder whether you would share those, some of those views. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, many of them, they all were proud to see that this generation has led this movement and been fearless and brave enough to continue to hold the country to the standard that they want to see the country reach. Um, I think some of the fundamental differences were that the civil rights movement, the traditional one that we all know about, was rooted in the church. So people like Fannie Lou Hamer and Dr. King uh, and, and those people who were more part of the mainstream part of the movement were coming out of the Southern Baptist Church. It was much less multicultural back, back then as well. And so the, I think the biggest, most chilling observation that they seen is the fact that there are so many people from so many different backgrounds who are involved in this movement, which has a, a lot of positive things, but also looking at the way that those, those groups in the movement react to each other and work with each other. And I'm sure Blair, you'll be able to speak about that later. So that was one thing. And then also the role that trauma continues to play in the African-American experience. And I think one of the frustrations that the civil rights leaders have have to this day is that they're still having to deal and to address some of the same issues that they were working on 50, 60 years ago, whether you're talking about the Little Rock Nine or, or any of them, they're still, and so that is one of the biggest problems. Um, how um, did they reflect on the question of leadership? Because one very big difference, as you allude to, is in the 1960s, there's Martin Luther King, there was Fannie Lou Hamer, there were uh, distinct Martin, uh, Malcolm X. There were very distinct leaders with very distinctive leadership styles. Um, fast forward to the present day, and um, leadership is somewhat federated by social media. Um, how did they, what were their reflections on that? I think just understanding that it's a much more fragmented movement because of social media. Back when they were organizing, they were meeting at churches and getting training on how to protest nonviolently and what that meant. Um, and they were very skilled at that because they had spent hours upon hours working with people like Fannie Lou Hamer, teaching them what to do if a fire hose is is brought out what to do if a if a um, if a dog is is sick on them all kinds of things now you have individuals who are getting involved by the millions who are 
finding out about things on so social media and heading down to Kenosha to, to become part of that movement and may not be as prepared as they were. Uh, and so we're seeing some, I'm not saying that these individuals were shot because they were not prepared. They were shot because a young man fired the gun. But I mean, I think it's important to understand that it's not as organized as it once was. And that's just a function of more people being involved from all kinds of backgrounds and not having a central place to be trained. Your, your book, um, which is- Sorry, I don't want to go out of turn. I just want to add a little bit of nuance to that as well, if I might. Yes, please. Thank yeah, you please. so much. Um, so I think uh, as well, it's an important discussion about how history is taught, that we view the civil rights movement as kind of having centralized leadership. And in my text, um, which I happen to have in my lap, I'll just read a, a bit about it. Um, to both the American government and the American public, the movement for civil rights was a unified effort. However, the civil rights movement was a collection of different people with different strategies working together toward a common goal. Despite these landmark accomplishments, injustice and violence continued to be a reality for Black people in the United States. And that was so crucial for me to include because for many people, seeing the leadership at the civil rights movement, yes, it was there to present a front. You know, people now say things like performative activism, da da da. All activism is performance, but not all performance is surface level. And so by having people speak from the different leadership groups, whether we have Medgar Evers, Edgar Evers' wife, John, uh, John Lewis, um, CORE, the National Urban League, leaders from those groups, it was to present a unified front. But these folks did not agree. When Dr. King became a, a rising figure in the Baptist church, even though he was speaking at, ba at Second Baptist, which is in LA, where my grandparents went, uh, my great grandparents went, they did not agree with his policies. My grandma is, uh, she's a month younger than Dr. or a month older than Dr. King. Oh no, a month younger than Dr. King. And she did not like his, his plans, you know, as even as a black woman in the Baptist church because they came from different contexts. So I think that it cannot be stressed enough that even the leadership there was fragmented. Sometimes it was just people who had heard or seen pamphlets who decided to get involved. Now that's just on a larger scale. Um, but of course, sometimes we look at the past with like rosier cheeks, especially when it's an easier history lesson to tell when you say Dr. King led the movement and everybody fell in line instead of understanding that no, my grandma who was literally from the same place as him, just a month younger than him, did not like what he had to say. And I think that really complicates it and makes it a richer discussion um, because then when you see people you know, squabbling or taking critiques amongst themselves, and then you look at you know, the way that W.B. Du Bois and uh, Marcus Garvey had fallen out, it makes you feel less like, oh, this is a current problem and more of an extension of what humans tend to do, which is disagree. So there's incredible complexity. And, and, and uh, I think part of what you're saying, Blair, is that maybe with the course of history, we have a propensity to simplify things and that we forget some of the, the texture and the complexity of it. Um, so th thank you for sharing that. And, and, and Lee, you've, um, your book is coming out. It's, it's going to be published by HarperCollins next year in 2021. It's titled Nobody's Slave, How Uncovering My Family's History set me free, which is a very interesting title. But right at the heart of the book is this concept of intergenerational trauma. And in your um, introductory comments, you came out with this um, horrific statistic, which is that in every generation of your family since the 1830s, a member of your family has been lynched. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, your experience of intergenerational trauma? How has, you know, you're descended from black slavery in Alabama uh, this is a 400 year history in your family of, slave, of slavery and, uh, and traumas of this kind. How has that impacted you personally? Well, I mean, in so many ways, but I'll just, uh, one example that I'll use is that when I was a child, corporal punishment was really big in my home. And it was also used against many of the African American children that I knew that I grew up with. And I didn't understand it, but it was something that I just thought and was raised to believe that was used to protect me from the broader society so that I would be so fearful that I would uh, sort of make sure that I was had a near perfect, carried myself in a near perfect way to never make any mistakes and to adultify myself at age six, seven, eight, eight years old to be acting like an adult because my parents feared so much for my life, that my father was still locked in Greenville, Alabama in his mind when we were growing up, when I was raised in Minnesota. 
And so we were in a predominantly white neighborhood, but we were also very involved in the black community. But when I was in that predominantly white neighborhood, there was no error, there was no room for error. And the, um, the punishment for that was a whipping with the belt. Um, and that, when I did my research, really went all the way back to my great great grandmother Charity, who would have been whipped on a plantation in Pike County, Alabama, who was only two generations prior uh, to my father. So th there wasn't a lot of time between my enslaved ancestor and my father. So the, the, the belief system is there. And that also applies to slave owners. We have to understand that there hasn't been a lot of time between people who owned and held black people in captivity um, and raped and cre created, committed atrocities against black women and the people who are here now. So we have two generations that have only passed. It hasn't been that long. And so we have to understand the way that the past and the trauma of the past can be passed down through the generations. And so a lot, a lot of my book is talking about how to confront trauma and move past trauma. And this generation, I think, is tired of having to tailor their behavior to near perfect and to have to adultify themselves in the way that I was. And I would have to say that they're very courageous and they're very brave. They're showing a courage that I'm only now being able to come out and show and to question, do we have to beat black children in order for black children to be safe in our society or to protect our black children? And if we do, then we have to ask ourselves, what's wrong with our society? There's also, um, but there is hope in your book, Lee. The title is How Uncovering My Family's History, Set Me Free. Tell me about the set, tell us about the set me free uh, part of that title. What does that mean? Well, it, it ties into what Blair was saying about the ancestors. You know, my, my aunt Norma Hancock was, uh, she had a heart attack, we believe, last week and she passed away and I'm headed to her funeral. But one of the things about her and her memory that I wanna make clear is that this is a woman who was a connection to the strength and the, dip, the deep wisdom of our ancestors. She's one of the central characters in Nobody Slave and she sat for hours of interviews connecting me to the stories of my, my great grandfather and his brothers who owned uh, 50, who owned three farms, who built up three farms in South Dakota from 1905 onward over a 50 year period and have gone down in the history of that state as some of the earliest people to do that. And these were African-American men whose father uh, was enslaved, who was a civil war private and everything. So the hope in there was that even though they were under such tremendous pressure and that their father had been enslaved and that he fought for freedom in the civil war, they were able to build what they built and I think that that speaks to the awesomeness of, of African Americans in this country that we have not always um, thrived because of America, but in spite of America. And that is the power, that's the hope there that if they could do it, this generation can definitely do it. And it also, the reason it set me free is because it helped me understand trauma at a physiological level, understanding that um, you know, all of this happens in the prefrontal cortex when we are processing trauma. When you see a video of a black man being shot, um, you know, 23 times by the police or whatever, or shot in the back as he's running away, all of that triggers the fight or flight or freeze response in the deep part of the brain. We have to understand that African Americans have been dealing with this for generations upon generations. And so it taught me the importance of self-care, knowing this history, reflecting on the history, but how do I find a way to not be so in the dark about my identity that I don't know where I'm going? And that was important for me to dig into the past so I could make sense of all of this and to process this and find out what I need to do independent of what America does or doesn't do. What do I need to do as an individual to free myself of slavery, to free myself of the legacy of Jim Crow? 
And that's important. Genealogy is a big part of that. And I think that more African Americans should study their genealogy. And I'm hoping to spark a movement with that and to help people dig into the past that was taken from them, that was erased from the history books. Can you talk about, um, you talked about the wisdom uh, of the of of you know ex exploring your lineage and the wisdom of the culture of of of, of black families, you, you yourself are a Baptist. Music has been something that's been in, that's incredibly important to you personally, but it's also been incredibly important to your family going back many generations. Can you talk a little bit about um, two things? The first of all, the importance of religion um, in terms of the lineage of your family and understanding the lineage of your family, and and secondly, the importance of music um, in the church, um, in, in exploring and understanding um, the worlds that, uh, the worlds of your ancestors and also the current, what the current, uh, your current environment now today. Yes, I think spiritualism is important, regardless of what religion you are. But for me, music was a big part of the way that I connected with my spirituality. Um, in those dark times when I was the only black kid in a predominantly white environment uh, who managed to become the class president all four years, but never really was fully accepted as a result of that, you know, that that was always some, there was, there was a lot of pushback as a result of that. And it was music and my involvement um, in the church and the way that the ancestors used to sing the songs uh, really inspired me. I was young, too young to really always understand the sermons, but I was able to connect more on music. And to me, that speaks to the way that hope plays into this, that when we look, we are on the path to res resolution, we can't allow ourselves to get stuck in just all of the things that are happening to happening to us and happening around us. We have to be addressing those things, but to not allow ourselves to, um, to be held captive by it. And so part of the freedom was a learning meditation, learning to express myself through music and all of the positive things that um, are a reflection of the deep history, the rich history of my family and all of the powerful things that they were able to do and to know those stories and to cling to those stories and understand the incredible um, sort of obligation that I have to continue in future generations, to inspire future generations to go even further beyond where our ancestors were able to go. Thank you. And um, uh, we're keen to bring Blair into the conversation. Magdalena, can I uh, pass it back to you? You've got some um, uh, questions now for Blair. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Blair, you're an acclaimed historian. You've written a wonderful book, Making Our Way Home, and it's about the great migration and the Black American dream. Yeah. Um, do you think similar to Lee, it was your personal history, your family's history that inspired you to become a historian to, you know, look into the past, to understand our present and our future? Certainly was, but it was also that which gave me an aversion to history. Because growing up, um, I every time black folks were mentioned in the United States, it was under the context of enslavement. And that made me feel extremely disempowered because that felt like that was the only contribution we had had as a people. And that, you know, black people started to exist during enslavement instead of understanding the, you know, ancient African empires, not just Egypt, which everyone likes to point to, but looking at ancient Ethiopia, Eritrea, you know, places uh, across uh, the African continent that uh, exist beyond sorry am i still here yeah no. did i yeah sorry um so places that exist beyond the um the just egypt because you know folks like to point to egypt but that's not it but anyway um and so for me that gave me an aversion because i was going to school with um chinese american students taiwanese students uh lots of white students from various parts of europe and i felt as though they had so many connections yet i had nothing and I still don't know where my ancestors are from because of enslavement. So it was just so disempowering. And the first time that I really started to love history was with my fifth grade teacher, Miss Terzia at Carver Elementary. And I'm doing um, a book read there very soon. And I got to speak to the faculty and staff about anti-racism recently. So I'm discussing about that. Um, but she was talking about historical erasure and how her family's last name was Terziva, 
but because of Ellis Island, it became Terzia to kind of start to get rid of the historical past. And I was like, oh, something has also happened to your people. And then it further took it to when she was talking about the American melting pot and how men the melting pot kind of implies assimilation versus the American salad, which is, you know, everybody gets to retain something, but the flavors come together and make something beautiful and delicious. Um, and then all of a sudden we started to shout out things, you know, like vegetables from China, you know, corn from South America, for salad dressing, you know, like just so many different things that we could add to this American salad. And that was the first history lesson I enjoyed. But before fifth grade, I did not love history. And that evolved further when my neighbor, who's um, Dr. Terry Roberts of the Little Rock Nine, um, when I saw a picture of someone who looked vaguely like him in my history book, but I didn't put two and two together. And I took the history book home, which we weren't supposed to do. And I was like, dad, do we know this person? Because you have to understand, for when I was growing up, we had large portraits of like Colin Powell, large portraits of Alex Haley, um, because my uh, great uncle, um, Charles Haywood, he was a painter. So we had all these paintings. So I assumed I was related to all of these people. We had these giant magnificent portraits. So I was like, oh, clearly these are my relatives, which is a very empowering place to come from. Um, and so I thought maybe this was another situation. My last name, my family's last name is Brown. I would say that Brown versus Board of Education was around our family. Not true, but I liked the, the lore, especially because I was the only black student in the class and I felt very unchallenged by those claims. Now I'm a historian telling the truth, but you know. Um, and so then I found out that not only had Dr. Roberts made history at 15 years old by being part of Little Rock Nine, but that he lived down the street from us and then I had access to him. So actually right now you can go to my YouTube channel, not right now, but later, um, and see my interview with him when I was, I think, 12 or 13 years old. And uh, he just came over in his sweatsuit, but we were dressed to the nines, my friend Katie and I, to interview him. And it was just like so tangible. And as an educator now, I can see that interview and I see like the gears working in my mind where, uh, you know, like as journalists, when you start to really develop your craft, when you don't need to write the questions down, but you just start asking follow-ups. And I did that as a, as a young kid because I was just interested and invested in the story. And it wasn't like an interview, it was just a dialogue. And there's so much we cut out of it, but I just remember him telling me the truth. You know, it wasn't that, oh, we, you know, held hands, we took it on the chin, whatever. It was that he was afraid that his, you know, uh, one of his close friends gave him a knife in case he had to use it, it was survival. And he told that to me as a young person and I was able to understand and grasp that because he talked about it in the context of bullying, talking about it in the context of dehumanization, which young people fundamentally understand. And so that's how it started to become part of my life. It was part of my family too, but starting to treat it as though it was an excavation where, okay, well, we have a history, it's somewhere there, but we have to unearth it. And so that's how I approach history now. And uh, it just puts a smile on my face truly. And now that so many people are interested and invested in this conversation around anti-racism and history, I feel as though I had to do a song and dance before to get folks to like want to listen to what I was talking about. But now people are just coming uh, to me for this education and it's really beautiful, but uh, so much of the beauty is also informed by trauma. Um, just if I could interject because you made a really good point there. Um, one of my best friends actually is somebody who I've known for 30 years, but I did not recognize, know until about a year ago that he was my cousin. He's a white man and when I ex excavated the history, I found out that he is a descendant of the slave owner who enslaved my great great grandmother mm. or the family who enslaved my family. And part of the excavation process has been to dig into that history and to help each other explore the legacy of slavery and the trauma on both sides. And so it's important to know that on the individual level, we can do this if we do the genealogy and that white people who were involved in the slave trade who had family members involved can actually free themselves or continue to try to make progress in their bloodline by working with African-Americans uh, and as one on this history and to unveil um, the, dead, the deadly and, and sad truths of the past. And that's part of the healing when I talk about what it takes to become really free and to process these atrocities and these crimes against humanity in America. Absolutely, I actually had a similar situation. So folks know my co-host Kate Robards on America Did What? We are actually very much connected in our family line. It's not necessarily in the same story as you, but the third time we hung out after we like, we connected very innately. And there's a saying, um, 
in, I think it's in Swahili, I don't know the Swahili saying, but it's that I smell blood. And it's when you see someone and you immediately know there's a connection there. It's like, you know, you smell the bloodline. So we've immediately connected, but we look different as night and day, you know, you would probably, you know, uh, characterize her as someone who would, you know, vote conservative. She's extremely progressive though and justice minded, but she has a Southern accent. She's blonde, she's white, she has green eyes. Here I am, green eyes, you know, I'm black. I have a hijab, I'm Muslim. And you would think that we are totally separate people, but her family last name connects to one of my family last names. So we might be cousins, but that's just so wild that the way that we met coming from completely different contexts has that connection. We can even look at um, Amy Cooper and I think Christopher Cooper, the uh, situation that happened on Memorial Day where Amy Cooper attempted to you know, weaponize her white womanhood and call the police on Chris Cooper. They have the same last name mm -hmm. and yet they found themselves at the spiral moment coming together. And, and that's just the story of America. You know, it's this idea that, oh, if we have separate lives and we portray it as though things happened long ago, not minding the fact that, you know, Harriet Tubman died in the 1900s. You know, this is so recent, talking about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, the Tuskegee syphilis atrocity just being settled in the 1970s, just coming to light in the 1970s under the same CDC that we have today. These are recent things. These are so intimately connected. And once you start to look at history in full color and realize that, no, people weren't walking around in black and white back then. People weren't walking around, you know, with these like stoic expressions. It was happening just as live and just as in color as it is today. It's just captured differently and told differently to disempower us. No, absolutely. And, um, oh, she gone. Sorry. And so you focus on, no, not at all. You focus on the great migration and making our way home. Why did you want to sort of uh, hone in on that particular period? It's a reconstruction to the emergence of hip hop, right? Yes. Yeah, so that was fun because, you know, thanks to my mentor, um, Feminista Jones, I, I did an interview with her prior to the book writing, like you do. Talk to all your mentors when something great happens like this, because um, it might be that your work gets to move forward, but you have to look back at the folks who got you to that position. So I talked to Tavanisa Jones and I was like, well, how can I make this more connected to the current era? Music, you know, Lee was just talking about music. As I was writing this book, I would try to listen to music from that time period to get my mind in that same, you know, in environment. Then you start to pick all types of thing out. This is not connected to the same history. But as I was on a road trip recently, we were listening to all these songs from the 70s and everybody's talking about rain in these songs, fire and rain, you know, just, you know, I can see clearly now. There was a drought in the 1960s, an abundance of rain in the 70s, and then a drought again in California in the 80s. So the themes of rain make sense. So we can do history in this way more enlivened way that we look at every historical aspect. We look at the lyrics, we really connect these stories. Um, and I was also using family documents to get that across. But hip hop, is a product of the great migration. It is not only a product of black American people, but by black African diasporic peoples coming from the islands, um, bringing patois, uh, you know, speaking jive, speaking um, African American English, just all coming together, speaking French, speaking Spanish, folks who are also, you know, from Spanish speaking Caribbean countries, uh, also Latin America coming through together, being forced, why? Because of redlining to live in the same communities and to fight together, why? Because of the war on drugs, the so-called war on poverty, which just impoverished more black people uh, and more people of color, indigenous folks, etc. These young people had to come together and form an armor against that. And they couldn't communicate perhaps by language, but they could communicate by music. Today we see TikTok, we see Instagram, we see what, you know, Twitter. And some folks will write these things off as just memes, but it is young people fundamentally speaking to each other in a way that is new. We have the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party 10 point program was extremely revolutionary. It said things like we demand housing, land, bread. We want to be able to feed and survive ourselves. We want people out of incarceration. If we're going to be tried by a jury of our peers, they better be Black people because of white supremacy. And they were characterized as radicals, but they were using the means that they had to explain things that they were experiencing through suffering. They created their own newspapers. Today, you might see somebody create a blog. You know, you might see the Black Panther Party in the past showing up with pins, with iconographic, you know, imagery, Black turtlenecks, perfectly symmetrical afros. They didn't just roll out of bed that way. There was so much intentionality that went into it. And so similarly, when you see folks coming to, uh, you know, for example, the March for Trans Lives uh, in Brooklyn just recently, earlier this summer, everyone's showing up in white. That's a 
in, intimately connected not only to the civil rights movement but the black power movement the uh you know in, indian power movement or red power movement uh it's just so interconnected lgbtq rights liberation so when we tell people young people that or anyone really anybody who is gen x or, or younger that your hip hop is a bastardization of the black culture if you tell someone that sagging pants is you know typifying or turning black culture into something that is a demonstration of poverty or an incarceration if you separate our legacies and say that by just you know turning our our history into language that we can tangibly touch whether that's through rap whether that's through mumble rap whether that's through whatever means and you say that it's not good enough you are disempowering people doo-wop Motown. We understand as a people that that came from the Great Migration, the Motor City, you know, Barry Gordy. But we don't connect in the same way. Not always, you know, hip hop scholars have been out here have been doing it, but oftentimes it's not reflected in the McGraw-Hill textbooks that we have access to uh, in American pub uh, public schools. But it's saying not only is this connected, but it is because of it, because hip hop is the most important cultural export of the United States, period. The fact that we can see you know, uh, with, you know, especially the, the solidarity that we've seen within Korean, Japanese and other Asian cultures around hip hop and realizing, you know, not only are we saying Black Lives Matter, but it is because of Black Lives that we have K-pop, that we have the K-pop stands that are taking over TikTok um, that are doing amazing things. The Korean translation, I believe, of Black Lives Matter is Black Lives are, are just as precious. And it's that connection, but that's dangerous to a white supremacist state. That is so dangerous for a global people to come together on something that transcends language and identity, but is rooted in black culture fundamentally and taking that and iterating upon it. And then to realize and say, hey, not only are we going to appreciate this, but we're going to make sure that the lives and the, the people who created this are taken care of. You know, hip hop was created in response to American oppression. The Great Migration happened in response to American oppression. It happened in spite of America, as Lee was saying. And so uh, I really love the arc of taking it from reconstruction to hip hop, because otherwise I would have had to end on Coin, Cointel Pro and the disillusion of these, you know, powerful black radical groups. And that felt inauthentic to me because that's not where the black story ends. Uh, that's not where black American history ends. That's not where the story of the great migration ends. That is how often it's told, but it really ends with hip hop, which is just another beginning. So it was to make it seem uh, and make it abundantly clear that it was hopeful, but also to make people understand that hip hop is not an anomaly of black culture. It is directly tied to black culture in the black church, in the, the black liberation tradition. And then it starts to make sense as we look at rap music as not just a musical genre or hip hop as a musical genre, but as a mechanism for explaining the conditions of black people, as well as empowering us to have our own culture and our own connections. Absolutely. And I think it's become apparent that, you know, all too much people have been disconnecting black culture from black history. And you know, I think 2020 has marked a really interesting moment because it's now it is a global movement. And Blair, you're such a outspoken advocate across social media. What role do you think social media has played in 2020 in bringing people together and it, you know, allowing people across the world to share ideas, share thoughts, you know, speak out, witness. Um, what, how do you, what role do you think social media is playing in activism today? So I have to again acknowledge Feminista Jones. She has an amazing book called Reclaiming Our Space. That's Reclaiming Our Space by Feminista Jones, which is all about the evolution of Twitter, social media platforms, et cetera, as a connection of everything from, you know, you know, Black Panther's newspaper or the, you know, Pullman porters who worked the, the rail lines of the Americas and also passed out newspapers like the Pittsburgh Courier, et cetera, to bring the Harlem Renaissance to people in the rural South, but also to the fact that we were a people who were denied language and the ability to communicate and the ability to speak to each other literally. You know, in the cotton fields, there were overseers who prevented people from being able to communicate. These conditions still exist in many factories, by the way. This idea that if you're communicating, then you're organizing, then you're going to subvert the status quo and you're going to, you know, you know, give the power to the workers instead of the, you know, uh, instead of the, the class of, of employers. But um, the way that she explains it is so, it, it's so important 
because she she talks in one essay in Salon about how Black Twitter is an extension of the Underground Railroad. And people say, what are you talking about? But if you really look at how social media has been used, it's not perfect. And it is still falling along privileged lines. But it is yet another tool in our toolbox of justice, like voting, like demonstrations, um, like taking a you know political action, like taking a stance. Twitter is another extension of that. I think that sometimes in social conversations and in, in intellectual conversations, it becomes a how does this factor in instead of it looking at it as a continuum where newspapers are here, Twitter is here, you know, it's a matrix, but it's also just another connection. Um, there was recently uh, a TikToker called K Does Things who talked about the creatinine study. Welcome to pause, Miss. Well, whilst we wait for uh, Blair to come back, Lee, how do you find as a journalist that social media has played a role in the documentation that you perhaps have done over the past year and the sort of instant reaction you've probably had to take? Is that? Yeah, I'm yeah. so sorry. I was just, where, what last part did you hear? Um, you were saying how Twitter is sort of... Um, An extension of the underground Okay, yeah. I talked very fast. That was a moment ago. All right, so um, she has a great essay on Salon about that and how uh, it's just another liberation mechanism and how important that is to, to really fundamentally understand. There's a TikToker recently who was making people aware of the fact that when you get a blood test as a Black person for the creatinine in your blood, which can, you have to be under a certain level to get a kidney transplant, there's a correction factor, which is based on a 1990 study of 200 Black people that then decides that all black people need to have a correction factor where their actual creatinine level is multiplied. So that makes, that's medical racism and that's resulting in, in people not being able to get the healthcare that they need. It will put a white person who has the same creatinine level as a black person higher on a list because a medical institution decided that all black people uh, need a correction factor to multiply their, you know, this chemical in their body higher, you know? And so, I learned that on TikTok, you know? These are just tools and mechanisms. Yes, I followed it up by learning at it, like, you know, looking at an essay because you could never learn from one source. But then I started to think, well, how can I use social media as a mechanism? So I've started to do these things called Smarter in Seconds, which I do every week where I educate people in 15 seconds on important issues about the attention span of the average person. I'm kidding. Um, I do Learn O'Clock, which are extended lessons. And I take that further on Patreon. But fundamentally, social media is just another tool in our toolbox and should be understood as such. Absolutely. And uh, so I think we're going to start moving over to questions. So everyone, please do put your questions into the box and we'll uh, begin to ask, answer them. Please, just, uh, well, both of you actually, finally, what do you feel um, in light of everything that's occurred in 2020 and, you know, the ongoing conversation, what do you think we need to take away from the energy and momentum we have right now to instigate real long-term change and progress into 2021? Larry, you wanna go first? Sure, so I think that um, for folks who are moving the conversation forward, like myself, like Lee, it's really not getting too caught up in, are we gonna be able to retain people's attention? Cause that's a losing battle. If you're chasing the people that you need to come to the conversation instead of the people who are already there. That's extremely debilitating, disempowering, like I can I continue to say. Um, so it's about really, you know, holding firm to the fact that this work will happen regardless of whether or not everyone who posted a black square on Instagram early in June is going to continue to do the work. There will be resources available, but we have been driving toward freedom quite before people realized there was even a car and that they were a passenger and that they are now backseat driving. So this work is going to happen uh, and has been happening. This is just an extension of this, uh, of, the, of the same work. So I think it's, it's continuing to listen to the people who are most impacted. If we're gonna talk about climate justice, it means looking at indigenous folks and uh, looking at how they are stewards of the land, doing land acknowledgements, resourcing them properly, paying them for their work. If we're talking about liberation and anti-blackness, listening to black folks. If we're talking about anti-Semitism, looking at, you know, listening to Jewish scholars and Jewish folks. So that's going to be the constant renewal. Voting, crucial, 
but not in the same way that we've seen the conversation where often it turns into you need to vote group of marginalized people instead of a why can't these people vote because there's only one polling station. I saw a news alert that the NBA has moved to have uh, stadiums, uh, you know, be voting locations. This is the work that needs to happen. But for any lay person, just anyone randomly listening, an everyday person, we cannot unlive this moment. Throughout our education, we have been asking ourselves, what would I would have done in the 1960s? What would I have done in the 1940s? What would I have done during enslavement? We are in that type of time. History is inviting you to be a part of the moment and it is your decision whether you'll be remembered as a bystander who let this moment pass us by or an active participant in making the world less terrible. Very good point and, and I think what she said that was so critical was when she was talking about the listening to African Americans, listening to Jews as they tell their stories about the Holocaust and the intergenerational impacts of that, listening to the First Nations people. Uh, because I do not believe when, if you remember when George Floyd was killed, there was a spate of different companies and people in the community that were asking African Americans to sell their story and their stories of racism that they've experienced. And there were many, many people who said they were surprised. Oh my gosh, I, I didn't know that any of this was happening. Do you know it's happening? If you have racists in your family, um, if you have uh, ancestors or elders who were part of the Ku Klux Klan or and many, many people do. And I say that not in an accusatory way, but just let's just be honest that white people in this country are aware of racism. It's sitting at their dinner table on, at Christmas time, right? So you know that racism exists. So what I think I'm encouraged by is this period of forced intellectual and, and emotional honesty that this, these conversations are forcing and that the young generation is forcing generation Xers and older to understand that, you know, you have revised the past, you have failed to confront the past or wanted to talk about the past. And guess what? We're not going to let you do that. Because for us to be a better nation, we have to first be honest about the past. And so I'm encouraged by this. When you see people talking about all of the division and there's so many terrible things happening right now for the first time in this country, I just, I don't buy it. The truth is it's been happening, except now we have this whole movement of young people who are calling the nation to task and saying, we're not going to stand for this. We are going to classify racism, call racism what it is, a human rights issue. And we are going to hold this nation to a better standard. And so I'm very encouraged by a lot of the things I see. And I think we can only move forward from here. Yeah, absolutely. And just the um, abundance of resources that we have available. There's actually a really good question um, from an anonymous attendee. But um, what are both of your thoughts on the um, NBA led sports strikes that happened this week? Do you think the players have weakened or strengthened their leverage by resuming play? And will the pressure for them to, will there be pressure for them to strike every time there's a police shooting video? I'm really excited about this question. Um, so the, the first, I'll answer the last question first. Um, the will there be, there has always been. Activists, organizers, et cetera, have constantly been looking at, you know, celebrities, whether they be in sports, music, et cetera, to stand up. We see this with the Super Bowl, with folks boycotting the Super Bowl while they're denigrating Kaepernick. We also see it with the uh, Mexico City Olympics, which folks think was just a black power movement, which it was, but it was also so crucial because they had an entire platform, including the removal of a racist and anti-Semitic leader of the Olympic Committee, um, the restoration of Muhammad Ali's heavyweight title, which was taken away because he refused to be a participant in the war in Vietnam, because why would he fight a white man's war when the, Vietnam pe the Vietnamese people had done nothing to him, yet he was supposed to fight them on behalf of a people that had never taken care of black folks. So it's all these intimate connections. And I, I really get so excited seeing Naomi Osaka speak up, uh, you know, both in English and Japanese to say as a black woman, I'm not going to participate in something that doesn't make sense to me. It, it's, it's that, you know, it's that opting out. Will it harm their cause? 
I think that players, teammates, etc., you know, like people who are who love the NBA but don't care about black people that play the sport are terrified right now, are now realizing what it looks like. Oh, okay, you're not going to treat us right. Goodbye. That states that makes the statement that has made a statement regardless. Does it change their, their bargaining power? Who's to say? But what we do know is that the unions. The, the players unions, the players associations are becoming stronger and stronger and that the people are listening, that it's actually in their interest of their career to be listening. And that's the shift that's crucial. That's crucial. It gives them more credibility with the people who have been mourning Kobe Bryant to say, hey, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, your favorite sports player, our lives matter. And it shouldn't just be that because we're athletes that we are saved from racism because that's not even how it works we know that henry lewis gates you know an esteemed black man who's all types of respectability a great scholar a great historian was still profiled trying to get into his home at harvard so it's realizing this having deep connections and not letting your class privilege or visibility privilege etc get in the way of your commitment to freedom so it's not new it's a continuation and it makes me extremely hopeful and excited i've had the privilege to sit down personally one-on-one -on -one with LeBron James, with J. Cole, with 50 Cent, with so many, Halle Berry, with so many people that I call the Black creative overclass. And when I say the overclass, I mean that they have come into wealth at a very young age and they are Black in the context of all of that. And it's a very, very difficult thing to go through, to be a multimillionaire in your 20s, and to still have that obligation and sense of responsibility to your people, which many of them have exercised and are starting to really show in a major way. Um, I've been interviewing people about these issues for many years. And I can tell you that this has been a long time coming, but it, it's been work that started with Muhammad Ali and even before then with Jesse Owens. But, but when we're talking about Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and Willie Davis and all of the individuals who sat with Ali when the Nation of Islam asked them to meet with Ali about uh, whether he was going to go into the Vietnam War and they came out in support of Ali and his decision as a conscientious objector, that was laying the groundwork for this generation I think one of the, the most threatening things, the, the real problem that we're having with the activism of these black athletes is the wealth and the tremendous amount of influence that they have. And the fact that right now, if the rappers, if Jay-Z, if the Jay-Z's of the world and all of the generation of young African-American men and women who are in the entertainment and sports industry, if they all come together with the athletes, uh, let's say that they had a Davos of sorts, a meeting where they could talk about the initiatives that they want to see move forward and to how to empower young people, that would be very, very threatening. And I think to, to anybody who would not be for the human rights agenda. And I think that that's the problem that people are having. They want the shut, shut up and dribble mentality, but so few of these people, when you really sit down on the, with them one-on-one, -on -one, are those kinds of people. These are beautiful people. When you look at Colin Kaepernick, whether you agree with his decision uh, to kneel or whatever, this is a young man that is in a evolutionary journey to find out who he is. He was adopted by white people. He was raised by a white family. His white mother never disclosed to him who his black father was, but he was embraced by the black community by becoming a member of Kappa Alpha Psi and, and continuing to learn about himself through the people who, who brought him in. And so that journey is sort of parallel with the journey that many biracial and black children and young people are going through to discover who they are and what that means in the context of America. So I would say that these young black athletes uh, you're not done hearing from them and you're going to see more generations of people coming behind if like, like for instance University of Alabama and a lot of these institutions that have the legacy of, of uh, Jim Crow segregation right now would be a time where you're seeing some of them start to speak out against Confederate monuments on campuses 
but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw black people start to refuse to play for the University of Alabama, um, if, unless there are reparations or there are different certain things that they want to see delivered and certain initiatives that they want to see brought forth. And you know that's just a part of the culture and what's happening now in this country. Once again, a generation that refuses to sit down and shut up. Yeah, it's the chain reaction, and you know, one action inspires another, and that's how we can move forward by everyone having the confidence so that they can stand up. And um, there's a really good question from Danielle Richard: um, How can white-led companies truly address this movement and engage with black employees? colleagues' experiences, especially mental health, rather than performing bureaucratic tick box exercises. One of the things that I'm most proud of about my company is that I'm sitting here right here with the chief innovation officer talking about these issues. Uh, he's, we have an affinity group called Black Insight, which most of us belong to. We meet regularly, we bring in speakers, we talk about issues in the context of being black in corporate America. Sometimes we've invited our colleagues to, uh, to become a part of that conversation and to listen to those conversations. And so I think that that's a part of what companies can be doing, but also going even further in understanding the economic piece and how critical it is to, to look at the way that people are paid and whether there are racial disparities in the way that women are paid and the way that people of color are paid. When people of color leave companies, why are they leaving companies? Do a study on retention. Look at that. That's another thing that companies can be doing. Uh, when people of color are speaking out about these issues, is there retaliation against them? Is there a feeling that, you know, this person is angry, we need to really figure out why when we've done all of these things, they should be happy as an executive, but we should empower people of color who are in positions of leadership to educate us about what it's going to take not only to recruit minorities or people of color, but to retain people of color and to really listen to them, not just to have them at a seat at a boardroom. When you, Another thing companies can do is to start to look at uh, when, you, when you recruit black people and people of color for your board of directors, what committees are they sitting on? Are they sitting on committees that have things that, that are relevant and, and, and important to the day-to-day -day operations of the, of the company? Or are they more symbolic committees that really don't impact the thrust of the company? I think that um, corporate America knows this too. I think there are many things that th th these are brilliant people. Most of these people were educated at the best business schools in the country and have a wealth of experience. Um, and so I would say that the vast majority of our Fortune 500 CEOs on their own can use common sense to figure out how uh, they can be a more equitable com company. And, but it first requires honesty it requires an open and candid conversation with the people of color in the company, but also with people who are not people of color and asking them and holding them accountable for the policies that they're setting and the people that they are hiring and not hiring and also addressing the, the fact that many people are uncomfortable. You know, I can tell you that when George Floyd happened, um, I had several colleagues reach out to me and I thought that that was great that people did that. But I also heard from people from high school. I heard from people from many, many years ago that I don't even really know. And I, I was wondering, you know, I'm the only black person you know, you felt moved to call me of all people. We haven't even talked for years. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, what, that's the trouble that we have to understand that we think that we can solve these issues just by extending a helping hand to a, a, another person or from calling an African-American person that we knew from high school and then just being done with it. No, there's a book by Benjamin DeMott called The Trouble with Friendship. And he's talking about in that book, it's, it's about how 
we can't solve the, our problems only through friendship. We have to understand the substantive benchmarks and measures and the hard empirical things that could be done to bring racial justice forward. And I'm not right here as an objective reporter, I can't argue for reparations. I can't argue for affirmative action. I can't argue for any of those policies, but I can tell you that there are things that couldn't be done financially and socially to move this forward. So I'm encouraged by the fact that we're having this conversation and that there are many people who are wanting to be a part of this conversation. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we become the companies that are on the forefront of this movement towards equality? And you wanna be one of those companies because of the SWIFT, if not just based on just altruism, pure altruism, do it because of capitalism. Because capitalism is inherent with this Democrat, this, it's intertwined with this, the swift demographics change that we're seeing. And the fact that people of color are the majority and will continue to be the majority in the future. If you're a consumer products company and you can't talk to people of color, you're not gonna be in business in 15 years. And so if you can't just do it because it's the right thing, do it because it's the best thing for your business and for your bottom line. Uh, um, if I could just interject one point about, you know, um, some of the conversations we've had internally at our company is, is um, you know, it's great to look outwards and it's great to be um, um, acknowledge the incredible impact of you know, what's happened in the aftermath of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, but we also have to look inward and that is important too. And so, you know, asking tough questions of ourselves internally. So, you know, some of the conversations that we've had, you know, candidly with um, Lee and some of our colleagues is, what about our internship program? What about the way that we recruit from colleges? Do we have bias in the way that we look at colleges, you know, particularly the Ivy League colleges? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm British, as you can tell from my accent, and I've lived in New York for seven years. I visited my first HBCU. It's a wonderful experience. But I mean, how are we recruiting from HBCUs? Um, what, is, uh, what, are, what are the mechanics for promoting people internally? And, and what are the controls in place for deciding who gets to go on the career advancement programs? And I think when you look at each of those areas, um, you find that there are things that need fixing. And I'm talking about our own company, right? I'm being honest about it. I'm saying we need the things that we need to fix. And those are the discussions we're having right now. So I think it's, it's, it's really important to look externally at what's happening in the wider world, but it's also really even, I mean, maybe even more important to look internally and, what are we doing ourselves as individuals, as people on this call to really make a difference in the companies in order that we create mer um, meritocratic organizations? And, 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 you know, we all want to work for more meritocratic companies, but I think the reality is um, that all of us have progress to make it in, in, on a corporate level, certainly in America. And millennials are requiring it now when they look, I can't tell you as I talked to, to immigrant, uh, sorry, to internship candidate, that's one of the things they ask. And this isn't just people who are people of color. These are white kids too that wanna know what kind of diversity initiatives do you have at your company? I wanna be part of a company that is based, looking to, to equity as the uh, solution. Absolutely, because the other thing too with millennials, you know, speaking as one, is that we have alternatives. The nine to five is not the only mechanism that we have for advancement. When I left my, my nine to five, you know, track, I had, you know, I had advanced quite quickly. Um, and then I started to write books and I got my book deal through social media. Whereas, you know, in, in other contexts, uh, I might've had to finish a, ma a master's program to be able to get the access to that, not necessarily the skill set, but the access to get to that level um, or to, to be deemed, you know, worthy because so many of the things that are qualifiers are things that we don't have access to as black folks, you know, BIPOC folks, it's black indigenous people of color, disabled folks, women, et cetera. So pipelines are so intimately important. But I think that now what we're seeing is not that, you know, Gen, Gen X or, you know, the boomer generation was less conscious about this. It was that capitalism also dictated how, how much you could speak up today because of cap, you know, because of uh, the different mechanisms for revenue, for advancement, we can be more vocal because we have a backup plan. And so I think that can't be discounted as well. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, especially at this moment, post or during the coronavirus pandemic and unemployment that's at record high, it's now more important than ever to really address the recruitment process and how we can open it up just because of the amount of people that are going to be applying for jobs and how do we identify the raw talent and strip away the privilege, the nepotism, anything that defines someone other than their ability to do that role and their passion and drive to make the most of it. Um, we've gone over uh, quite a bit, but thank you so much. Before we close off, unless we've got any other questions, um, I'd love to hear from you both. What's next? What, what are you working on? What, how are you moving forward from today, August 28th, 2020? You wanna go ahead and play? Sure, no problem. Um, so I'm continuing to educate on Instagram, you know, on Patreon, etc. cetera, um, whether that's through the Reels function with Smarter in Seconds, Alarm O'Clock every Sunday night. Um, I'm also working with a PhD candidate named Le Leah Neiman, and we're working on a book about the history of puberty um, from antiquity to the present and everything that that means for the current era. Um, so I'm keeping busy. Uh, and then I'm also, uh, you know, I think that sometimes these conversations we end with self-care but remember that taking care of yourself is intimately connected to the rest of the world. We know that through the pandemic, we know that just by mask wearing, but if you're not functioning from your best place, then you're going to affect other people perhaps negatively, especially if you're in a decision-making process. That means anti-racism, that means being inclusive, et cetera. So continue to do this work, not like, like Lee said, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the you know beneficial thing to do on multiple fronts. Amazing. Great. And for me, I'm going to be continuing doing journalism as I do every day, but also uh, to get ready for Nobody's Slave, which is, by the way, just to tell you, is available for pre-order now, but it will be announced in 2021. It will be released September 2021. And in that journey, I want to inspire people, partic particularly African-Americans, but not limited to African-Americans, to dig into their family history to use it as a healing mechanism to talk, you know, and I think that I can help people do that by explaining how I did my research and also to encourage people to be independent thinkers, to seek out knowledge, but not just regurgitate ideas that you picked up on cable TV and just spout out all of those ideas about where we are in American history and our past, but do your own independent research and form your own opinions and shock people, people who might think that you come from a monolithic people with that, where there's no nuance and complexities. Let's talk about the reality that we have the ability to do all of this research and to draw our own conclusions and to bring forward our own messages to, to educate and inspire people in the future. And that's what I want to do. I want to be part of that conversation and to help people use these tools that we have at our disposal to find out who we really are and where we come from. Absolutely. I agree. And I think, you know, part of the reason I really wanted to do this event today, because I think it is so important that we all take this time in whatever capacity and, and however we want in however way we can to educate ourselves, to learn and to understand. And I think both of you as individuals are doing such an amazing job to educate people. And I'm Lee, I'm thrilled to read your book. I'm really excited. Blair, I uh, have a coffee and I love it so much. And anyone, uh, you can always buy our bookshop, Liberia. Um, I will send that in the follow-up. Um, yeah, thank you so much, guys. Thank Please, you. Thank you. I'm really um, proud that it I'm proud that it was someone from my company, a leader from my own company, that asked me to be part of this, this, this discussion. So that means a lot, too, to me, to know that our company values this. That's important. Yeah, no, so it's a hopeful time, and I'm really hopeful for the future, and I'm excited to see where from today everything goes, and I look forward to seeing all the progress that's going to be made and you know thank you to the Bagruan Institute Rachel if you're still there uh, we've got those brilliant events coming up our next event on the 14th of September is with the philosopher
Elif Shafak. They're going to be talking about how, how um, you know, winners and losers in today's society is driving us apart and how we can move forward from that and uh, move away from polarised politics. And then we also have on September 24th, Blair, you might be aware of Get Lit. Um, I'm not sure. They're an um, incredible spoken word activist um, organisation in Los Angeles. And we're going to be doing an incredible spoken word and poetry event with 16 year olds and young poets who want to speak up and have their say and demand change so yeah, it's an exciting time it's an exciting program coming up thank you guys enjoy your days and uh, yeah thank you to everyone that tuned in keep have up the good time. work Blair thank you likewise Lee right thank, thank you thanks, everyone uh, thanks Lee thanks Magdalena thank bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.